Okay. So this is the review handout that you got yesterday, or in some of you today. Notice that you can bring your unit circle to this test. You can bring a 3 by 5 note card. You can use all six sides of it if you want. Two are easier than the other four, but... Um, good. No graphing calculator, as usual. We will have our scientific yellow department calculators here, plenty to go around. So that's good. Um, the entire first page of this review is sort of one of the themes of this unit, which is simplifying trigonometric expressions. So let's start at number one. So we have cosine x times tangent of x. And the thing that you want to remember about, hey, I can barely write on this. Let's see. <laughs> it's going well to start with. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Like I really have to press down hard to make this thing. Let me try this. There we go. Now, tangent of x, when you're doing identities, when you're trying to simplify something, the automatic thing you should try doing is converting that to sine of x over cosine of x. So our objective is to reduce the number of functions shown to simplify the contents of the parentheses as much as possible and so forth. So by converting that to sine of x over cosine of x, I can right away cancel out the cosines because this is really cosine over 1. And that gives me just sine of x. an eraser I could erase this thing with, but no. This is why it's so much more fun to do this offline. Okay, so number two, one minus sine squared a over cosine a. Okay, so anytime you see a trig function that's squared, you should be thinking about the Pythagorean identities. And the one I'm thinking of here is the sine squared a plus cosine squared a equals one. So I could rearrange this expression, or this equation, so that I could get um, 1 minus sine squared. So 1 minus sine squared a would be equal to cosine squared a. Does that make sense? OK. So that means I can rewrite this as cosine squared a over cosine a. And since cosine squared a means cosine a times cosine a, that means I can cancel out one of those cosine a's. That cancels the denominator, and I get to cross out one of those cosine a's in the numerator, and that just leaves me with cosine a. Number three. Let's just write these out. I can do substitutions for secant and cotangent. I'll rewrite it as I go. So I rewrite sine of b. Maybe it would be convenient to write it as sine of b over 1. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So that's 1 over cosine of b. Cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, which means it's going to be cosine of b over sine of b. Well, this looks pretty good because I've got a cosine and a cosine to cancel and a sine and a sine to cancel. And I can do all this cancellation because these things are all multiplied together. So I can be pretty greedy about my cancellations. And that just means that when everything cancels like this, you get 1, not 0, 1. All right, number 4, sine squared c plus cosine squared c over sine squared c. Ah, thinking uh, trig functions squared. I should be thinking Pythagorean identities. What I should not be thinking here, and it's, sometimes it's tempting to say, oh, I've got a sine squared c over sine squared c. Let me cancel that. When you're canceling, trying to cancel, and the numerator or denominator is a sum of things, you really have to do a sort of a dis distributed cancellation. So the thing you're canceling has to appear as a factor in every single term. It's not the case here. Sine squared c is only in one of these terms, so I can't cancel it. However, way back up here, I saw this Pythagorean identity about sine squared plus cosine squared. And I say, aha. This is equal to 1 over sine squared c. 
and that's pretty good. Um, I can simplify it further because 1 over sine is cosecant. So 1 over sine squared c would be cosecant squared c. Oh, yeah. 1 over sine squared yeah. yep. equals cosecant. This one's going to be tons of fun. So uh, for my next step on this, I think I'm going to try converting everything all at once into its equivalent form um, and rewrite that. So cotangent y is going to be cosine over sine. So I've got cosine y over sine y. That looks pretty weird. Tangent sine of y. Hey, look at that. My pen changed size. Freaky. That's, that's always an adventure. So my cotangent y and tangent y are going to be changed into these fractions. And then that's all over. Well, let me go back. 1 over secant squared y. So secant is itself the reciprocal of cosine. Yeah. So let me do a quick simplifying thing here and just use the reciprocal function. So I'm going to take this and protect it inside brackets and say this is going to be multiplied by, it was secant, right? OK, so this is going to be multiplied by cosine squared y. So I addressed all of these functions in one, one shot. I've converted the cotangent and tangent into their fractional forms, and I've taken the secant and I've converted it into a cosine. By converting it to cosine, I had to take the reciprocal. Since it was in the denominator to start with, it's now in the numerator. So it's multiplied by these two fractions. So how can you, you can just do that, you can use cosine squared. I don't get how you change that from secant. Okay. So one thing I could do, just as sort of an aside here, shouldn't be changing my sizes too much. OK, so I could have written this as um, those fractions all over 1 over cosine squared. So I could have had 1 over cosine squared in the denominator. Does that make sense? OK, so whenever you're dividing by a fraction, it's the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So I did those two steps at once. I converted it to 1 over cosine squared, and then I multiplied by its reciprocal. Now, inside the square brackets, I've got a couple of fractions that really don't want to be multiplied together or added together because they don't have a common denominator. So I'm going to create a common denominator. On the left-hand fraction, I need to multiply by cosine y. And on the right-hand side, I need to multiply by sine y, sine y over sine y. On the left, it's cosine y over cosine y. I'm multiplying both of these fractions by 1, essentially. So cosine y over sine y times cosine y over cosine y plus sine y over cosine y times sine y over sine y. And for a moment, this really looks horrible. And maybe for, maybe for a moment or more uh, still, I'll throw in that cosine squared y there just to keep that going. So now inside my brackets, I've got two fractions that do have the same denominator. The denominator is sine y, cosine y. And I can rewrite that accordingly. So my numerator now is going to be cosine squared y. That's what I get from these two. Plus sine squared y, which is what I got from these two, all over sine y, cosine y. And that's times cosine squared y. Not out of the woods yet, but we're pretty close. So what's cosine squared y plus sine squared y? One. One. That's good stuff. 
So continuing down the page, I've got 1 over sine y cosine y times cosine squared y. So there's some cosines, a cosine I can cancel. I've got a cosine squared in the numerator on the right, and I've got a cosine y in the denominator. So I can convert that all to 1 cosine y in the numerator over 1 sine y in the denominator, which is? Cotangent. Cotangent. Yes. <laughs> Somebody says it's fun. Um, how, so what if you like screw up one step? How many points will you get off? <laughs> like one little thing. Well, okay. So on the test, if we've got a very complicated uh, expression that needs to be simplified, obviously getting it fully simplified would be what you need to do to get full credit. Mm -hmm. But what we usually do is say for every sensible, valid substitution that you make, we we throw we throw you a point. And so, you know, for making good progress towards a solution, you get most of your points. And for getting the final answer correct, you get the whole, the whole thing. So it always makes sense to plunge in. Yes? How do you, how do you get from the, 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 um, the squared? Because if you divide it, when it make the top or the Uh, you're talking here? No. Say again, Ellie? Wouldn't it be like the top that has the cosine plus the sine? Right. Our numerator here is cosine squared y plus sine squared y. And this is from adding these two fractions together. So the... Pythagorean identity for cosine squared plus sine squared gives me just one. So we didn't do any fancy cancellations to get that one. No, not at all. So to go from there to there, we use the Pythagorean identity. I think we're at the bottom of the page. Okay, so I'm going to claw my way back up to the top. Or number six. Okay. So on the left-hand side of this, sine A, cosine B, that by itself is just pretty much nothing I can do with that. Um, on the right, I've got sine of negative A and cosine of negative A, and there are substitutions for those that are useful. So reproducing as I go here, writing the left-hand side doesn't change. Sign of a negative thing. Anytime you have a negative sign inside the parentheses of a sign, that's confusing. Negative sign, S-I-G-N, inside the parentheses for a sign, S-I-N, um, you can move that negative outside. And so that simplifies the contents of the parentheses. So this is going to be plus negative sign A. Cosine, if you have a negative sign, S-I-G-N, inside the parentheses, because the shape of the cosine curve is symmetrical about the y-axis, having a negative inside the parentheses, which would normally reflect your function horizontally about the y-axis, when you reflect the cosine curve, it looks exactly the same. So cosine of a negative thing is exactly the same as cosine of the positive thing. So this is just cosine of B. So really what I have here is sine of A, cosine of B, minus sine of A, cosine of B. And if you go to look for, like, what is that equal to, don't forget to just sort of notice the obvious thing. Sine of A, cosine of B, and sine of A, cosine of B. These are the same. So subtracting them, you should get a big fat zero. Zero, not one. Not one. Not one. <laughs> Uh, a quick pro tip, if, you've, if you do one of these things and you're, you have a little time and you want to check your work, you can do that. So these are identities. If you take a value for A, just pick any random value for the variable and plug it into the original expression and get a number, 
you should get that same number when you plug that value into the final simplified expression. All right, number seven. Cotangent of 90 minus x. So there's a cofunction relationship that says anytime you've got a 90 minus x, you're doing the trig function of the complementary angle. You can convert that to the complementary function instead. <coughs> So the cofunction for a cotangent is tangent. So this just becomes 1 plus tangent x times tangent x, or 1 plus tan squared x. And if you go in your note card, you should have a series of three Pythagorean identities. This should show up there. And the identity for that says that it's equivalent to secant squared of x, which is all you need. So because those um, equal each other, you would have to write like what one plus tan, tan squared x is equal to, because like isn't it already like kind of um, reduced down? But you, so would you get points off if you just wrote one plus tan squared? Yeah, it's so. I I would argue that secant squared x is is, is there's less stuff there than yeah. there is for one plus tan squared x, and so it's true that mathematically it's identical. So why bother? Mm -hmm. Well, we could start with the original expression and say, well, it's identical, so why bother? Um, the idea is that we're just trying to reduce the complexity of the expression. Mm -hmm. So if we have a lot of math that we're doing and we need mm -hmm. to simplify, the less complexity, the better. All right, so on the left we have uh, sine of 2a. So we can go to our double angle section of our note card and write the substitution for that. So sine of 2a is 2 sine of a cosine of a. And we're adding to that 2 sine of a cosine of a. So we've got two of each. I bet we have a total of four. I, um, I don't see anywhere to go with that, so I, th I think that's about as good as we can get. Uh, you could conceivably go the other way with this and say that we're going to end up with 2 sine of 2 a's. <coughs> Not sure how I feel about that, but there you go. All right, uh, 1 minus cosine b looks sort of like something you would get from the Pythagorean identity for cosine and sine, except that it's not squared. So 1 minus cosine b is not the same as sine of b, because it's not squared. So this by itself, each of these pieces by themselves don't have anything that we can convert them to. The only thing I can think to do with this is just to multiply these two um, expressions together using the FOIL. And when I do that, I'll get 1 minus cosine b plus cosine b minus cosine squared b. So this cancels with that, and I end up with 1 minus cosine squared b. And that is something that I can use the Pythagorean identity with. That's equivalent to sine squared b. <coughs> All right, one big long one. Take a deep breath and plunge on in. Sine of 2x, we look that one up and we see that that's 2 sine of x, cosine of x. And converting as we go, tan of x is uh, sine of x over cosine of x. Cotangent is cosine of x over sine of x. Um, the astute observer will notice that this immediately cancels sine over sine, cosine over cosine. You can also, if you're clever, whenever you see these two together multiplied, you say, ah, matter and antimatter can't exist in the same place, so it goes away. Secant, 1 over cosine. Yep. Where did you get the cosine from after the two sides? Um, this is the double angle formula for sine. 
that whole thing. So just sine of x. So the cosecant turns into 1 over sine of x. So this goes away, that goes away. I've got sine over sine, that cancels out. Cosine over cosine, they cancel out. I've completely run out of trig <coughs> functions to work with. The only thing left behind is the 2. And that's the answer. It's not like 2 sine and 2 cosine, just 2. It is just 2. Everything, everything went away. Next page, look at that. All right, number one, part two. Find the exact value of cosine of 75 degrees using the angle sum formula for cosine. So yes, you could take your calculator and calculate the cosine of 75, and many calculators would give you an approximate value. Um, this is a technique for finding an exact value. So we could treat this as the sum of two angles. We could use 30 degrees and 45 degrees. We're choosing angles that have nice cosines and sines on the unit circle. So our favorites are things like 30, 45, 60, um, 120, 135, and so forth. And then we'll use the angle sum formula for cosine, which goes cosine, cosine, sine, sine, sine. Cosine, cosine, sine, sine, sine. Cosine, cosine, sine, sine, sine. So I have cosine 30. Sorry. Now that emphasized sine means that the sign here, S-I-G-N, gets flipped. So this becomes a minus. And then I do sign of everything. But it's, is it the same for sign? Okay. Sorry? It's the same, is it just the same for sign? The signs? <clears throat> the sign? Yeah. <laughs> the angle sum for sign, the signs are the same. The S-I-G-Ns <laughs> are the same. Only the cosine flips. So at this point, you would go, if you don't remember what these are, each of these terms now has an exact representation that you can see in your unit circle. Cosine of 30 degrees is 1 half. Cosine of 45 degrees is red 2 over 2 minus. Sine of 30 degrees is, no, I, I made a mistake, folks. Uh. Uh. <laughs> Shooting from the hip. Cosine of 30 <laughs> degrees is not one half. Thank you. One half. Fail. <laughs> sine of 30 is one half. The sine of 45 is red 2 over 2. Isn't it fun to see your teachers screw up? Yeah. That's wonderful. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> So uh, we've got red 6 over 4 minus red 2 over 4. So we can just write it as a single fraction. Denominator is 4. Red 6 minus red 2 all over 4. Number two, find the exact value of sine of 22.5 using the half angle formula. So, a little confusing. We'll treat this as the sine of 45 degrees over 2, which seems kind of pointless, except anytime you're taking a sine or a cosine of something divided by 2, you can try that out in the half angle formula. Half angle formula. So that would be something you keep on your note card. And in your note card it says plus or minus, so I'll write that in for the moment. 
big square root 1 minus cosine 45 degrees over 2. Now, we don't want to leave an answer that's plus or minus. This is either plus or it is minus. So at this point, what you can do is think about the sine of 45 degrees over 2. What quadrant is that going to be in? First quadrant. Is the sine positive or negative in the first quadrant? Positive. So, we're going to leave that as a positive. And we can go on, and we know what the cosine of 45 is. Um, with a little, I mean, that's not as simple as you can make it with a little more um, jumping through hoops, you can get it down to something like this. Um, the square root of 4 in the denominator means you can take that 4 out and you'd end up with 1 half square root of 2 minus root 2, which is a pretty kooky thing. We've got a root inside a root. Um, and again, if you wanted to check your work, you would say, okay, I'm going to put my, get my calculator and type in sine of 22.5. And then compare that to the evaluation of 1 half rad 2 minus rad 2. Being very careful to keep track of your parentheses, make sure everything is in the proper place. They should match. And I, wouldn't, I would do that if you had time at the end of the test and you wanted to check your work. Uh, another example for an addition or subtraction formula for cosine. Expand and simplify using an angle difference formula. So we have cosine x minus i over 2. Cosine, cosine, sine, sine, sine. All right, here we go. Cosine x, cosine pi over 2, plus, I'm going to use the opposite sign, of course, sine of x, sine of pi over 2. <laughs> when it's in radians, can you just make your final answer in degrees or degrees? Mm, I, you know, I don't think you need to worry about converting to degrees on this. So, your unit circle should have angles in radians as well as degrees. So this shouldn't be too difficult to do. The next step in this requires that you think about what the cosine of pi over 2 is. Zero. zero. That's zero. That means this whole left-hand side goes away, because this cosine of x times zero is just always going to be zero. And sine of pi over 2 is 1. So that's going to be 1 times sine of x which means our final answer is just sine of x. So we didn't have to worry about you know, converting any angles to degrees. We just had to be able to look up some very simple things about sine and cosine for radian angles. Nothing too tricky. All right. Suppose tan of a equals one-third, and tan of B is two-thirds, and A and B are both in the first quadrant, find the exact value of tan of A plus B. Okay. You think you know what you're doing at this point, right? No. <laughs> okay. I see so many interesting ways of doing this incorrectly. <laughs> so, this is one you should not get wrong really should not get wrong. Tan of A plus B. Hmm. Maybe I should write down essentially the angle sum formula for tangent. So tan of A plus B is this fraction, tan of A plus tan of B over 1 minus 
tan A, tan B. Pay attention to the signs of those um, plus and minus, numerator and denominator. Again, we've got this plus and minus, minus plus, plus minus thing going on. So that's your first opportunity to make a mistake. Why make this sound so negative? That's your first opportunity to have success. Get the signs correct. Now, this says tan of A. That doesn't mean throw in a one-third here for A. A isn't one-third. Tan of A is one-third. Tan of B is two-thirds. So wherever you see a tan of A, put in a third. Wherever you see a tan of B, put in two-thirds. So you don't have to reach for a calculator on that. You don't have to compute the tangent of anything. You already know what the tangent of A is. The tangent of A is one-third. You already know what the tangent of B is. The tangent of B is two-thirds. You do have to be able to manipulate fractions, though. So, one-third plus two-thirds is three-thirds, which is one. One minus one-third times two-thirds. Uh, you really want <laughs> I will, I will make a confession. I make this mistake so, so often because I'm used to thinking in terms of adding fractions. Then multiplying two fractions together, we're going to go straight across. The fact that the denominators are the same, don't be fooled into thinking you just keep one of those denominators. You're multiplying across. Two ninths. Two ninths. So one minus two ninths is what? A number. Three it's nine ninths minus two ninths. Seven ninths. Seven ninths. One over seven ninths is. I don't know. Number again. How do you you have to do this in your head? Oh, you have a calculator. No, 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 no. You take the reciprocal of the denominator. Thank you, Kate. Oh, right, nine over six. Nine sevenths. Oh, cool. Good fun. I don't think I was taught that the reciprocal thing. Oh, it's never too late to learn. I, the, definitely a lot of people come through here not knowing that. Yeah. It's never too late to learn. It's a great technique to understand. Number five. <laughs> Is this tomorrow, right? Can you finish the, like, will you do the rest of the video? Yes. We'll get the okay. whole thing. So I think our period ends in, what, four minutes? Okay. I'm going to keep going. You don't have to stay. You're, you're welcome to. I'm going to record the full thing and put it on the, on the Internet. So with all of its flaws and all of the chatter in the background. <laughs> okay. We're not done yet, though. Let's keep going. Number five. Angle of inclination for the line. 6 equals 4x minus 3y. For questions involving angle of inclination, we need to get a slope. We need to be working or thinking in terms of slopes and angles. So for me, looking at 6, minus, six equals 4x minus 3y, I don't right away know what the slope should be. So I want to convert it to slope-intercept form. Minus 3 plus 6 minus 6. So I'm going to do uh, throw things around a little bit there. Divide by three, thank you. And I divide everything by three on the right-hand side, of course. Get y equals four-thirds x minus two. So it's a line, looks roughly like that. Our angle of inclination is right there. It's the positive angle formed between the line and the positive x-axis. So the axis to the right of the line. 
And I'm going to make use of the fact that the tangent of the angle of inclination is equal to the slope. So that's from your note card. So the tangent of theta equals 4 thirds. So how do we find theta? Negative tan, negative tan, right, inverse tangent. So theta equals inverse tangent 4 thirds. Now, when you do this, you have to keep your brain engaged because if your slope is negative, you'll get a negative angle. But then you add 180. You'd add 180 to that. So you always want to picture in your mind the actual line that you're working with and where you want that angle to end up. And think about the angle your calculator is giving you and make sure that you're returning to me the right thing. So when, it, when it's um, a negative angle, is it doing the wrong side of theta? So that's why you add 180. Okay. Right. So a negative angle would be if you had a, a line like this. Your calculator will give you this angle here. You want this one up there. So they're on together those angles, the absolute values of those angles will add up to 180. Could it be this long? That test is going to be, I think, shorter than this. Mm -hmm. I should be shorter than this. So we're aware of the fact that this is kind of a long review. Um, page three, part three. We have a couple of graphing questions. First one starts with an equation and asks you to graph it. So we can look at pieces of this equation and tease out some information. The amplitude is going to be the multiplier in front of the function. So that tells us how tall the function is going to be. And that's just going to take the number 2 and use that. The b value is literally the value that appears in front of the x. It's the coefficient. So pi over 4. The period is not going to appear here, so let's hang for a moment on the period and look at what else we can figure out. A vertical shift appears as something added or subtracted on the outside of the function. So we have a vertical shift of 1, which is going to be up. Horizontal shift would be something added or subtracted inside the parentheses going into the function, and there is none of that, so we have no horizontal shift. Now, the period. period is going to be the value of x, which, when it's multiplied by pi over 4, gives us a full period for sine, which would be 2 pi if we're working on radians. So the way to calculate what that x value would be would be to take 2 pi and divide it by the b value, pi over 4. So that's a slightly tricky fraction. Right away, I would say that the pi's would cancel out. Now we have 2 over 1 fourth. And then we can use that trick that says if we're dividing by a fraction, we can multiply by its reciprocal instead. So that's going to be 8. So now we know our period is 8. And if you think back to this uh, equation here, you had pi, uh, pi over 4 times 8. The 8 and the 4 would cancel to give you 2. So you'd have 2 pi, which would be one full period the sine function, which is what we want. So now to graph it. Let's start by looking at the vertical shift. Vertical shift is positive 1. So that means we can imagine sort of a virtual x-axis at the y equals 1 level. Our amplitude is 2, so that means our function is going to go up 2 and down 2 with respect to that virtual x-axis. So we're going to have a maximum at 3 and a minimum at negative 1. I'm just sort of highlighting that to keep that in mind. Um, our function is a sine function, so that means it's going to start at the origin. And for us, that means starting at the origin of our virtual x-axis. So I'm going to put a red dot there. Our period is 8, and that means that after 8 units have gone by, we should be back where we started. So I'll put another red dot on the virtual x-axis over it, x equals 8. 
Now, keeping in mind what a sine function looks like, should do this. And that means that we should be on our virtual x-axis halfway between 0 and 8, or at 4. And now I can fill in the peak, the positive peak, which is halfway between 0 and 4. That should be x equals 2 and y equals 3. That's our maximum y value. And our minimum point from my sketch is going to be between the 4 and the 8. And that's at our minimum value, which is y equals negative 1. So it's x equals 6, y equals negative 1. So I've got the three points where this curve crosses our virtual x-axis, and I've got the two points where it's maximum or minimum. And I can now sketch a nice smooth curve that passes through all those points. Questions? Yep. It's all good. Okay. And now we're going to go the other way. So we can kind of do this in reverse and think about um, whether there's a virtual x-axis for this. Um, I notice that the maximum value that our function takes on is 1, and the minimum value appears to be, let's see. Uh, I think it's negative 5. I can just sort of sketch out a horizontal line from negative 5. It is negative 5. So the min to the max is a total of 6 units. To go from the minimum value to the maximum value, we have to go 6 units in y. And that means our amplitude is exactly one half of that. On our sheet, it looks like min's negative 4. Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. No, it's a little bit. Um, my hope is that on a question like this on the test, we'd have a nice grid that yeah. you could use as a reference. That would be very handy. So I can write in my amplitude 3. And the next thing I'd want to do is sketch in my virtual x-axis. So that's going to be between the negative 5 and the 1, right smack in the middle. If I know the six units between them, I can just count up three units from one end, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2. So that's the level of my virtual x-axis at y equals negative 2. And that is the vertical shift. So my vertical shift I can write in negative 2. And that's going to be down. Now, period. I want to find some features that I can identify that tell me the period. So, for example, if I find the peak value here, it's at x equals 1. The next peak value is at 17. So to go from 17 or from 1 to 17, is a total of 16, and that's my period. How'd you get the amplitude of 3 again? Sorry. I looked at the maximum value, the oh. peak value, and the, the minimum value, the two, the, the crest and the trough of the wave. Oh, so it's like how far it is from negative 2. And so the oh, amplitude so is always one half of that distance yeah. from the max to the from min. From the y, oh, okay. So I write in my period. Now the process for finding the B value is the exact same thing we did to find the P value in the previous question. We do 2 pi for working in radians over the period. So that's 2 pi over 16 or pi over 8. So we're almost there. The last thing to do is a horizontal shift. So this positive peak here 
that's the feature that's closest to the y-axis. And if this were a cosine curve, cosine starts at its maximum on the y-axis. So I'd say this is most similar to a cosine curve, and I'd like to call it a horizontal shift of a cosine curve. And it's a shift to the right of one unit. So our horizontal shift is one. Let me change my color back. to the right. So now we've got all this information. We can write the function. f of x equals, we start with the amplitude, 3. Our function type, we like cosine, parenthesis, then goes the b value, pi over 8. Now, if you don't have a horizontal shift, this is where you put the x. If you do have a horizontal shift, you want to put that inside parentheses also. x, and the shift to the right is going to be either plus or minus. Which is it? Minus. 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 Our shift is 1. Close all the parentheses. And then finally, I ran out of room. We'll add our vertical shift, which is negative 2. answer for that. The last page. Find the acute angle between the two lines, y equals 2x plus 1 and y equals negative 3x minus 2. Okay. Um, I'd like to start with this one by at least sketching a rough idea of what these lines should look like. So 2x plus 1, that is a y-intercept of 1, and a pretty steep upward slope. Let's call that line alpha. And the other one is a slope of negative 3 and a y-intercept of negative 2. So it's pretty steep down. We'll call that line beta. We want to find the acute angle between the two lines. Well, let's see. I'll zoom in on the sketch a little bit. So, for example, we could look at the angle of inclination for line alpha. Let's say that's that angle alpha there. The angle of inclination for line B, or beta, is this angle, beta. If we want the acute angle between the two lines, that's going to be this piece right here. So that would be angle beta minus alpha. So the trick here is that we're, we're trying to do a subtraction of two angles, and we happen to know the slopes of the lines that they are associated with. So what I'm going to do is a little trick. I'm going to say the tangent of the difference of these two angles is something. And I can write the equivalent using the angle difference formula. That's going to be tan beta minus tan alpha over 1 plus tan beta tan alpha. And Two x plus one is alpha. So tan alpha equals two. That's the slope of that line. And tan beta 
is negative 3. That's the slope of that line. So I can bring that information back into my tangent formula here and say that what I've got is negative 3 minus 2 over 1 plus negative 3 times 2, which is negative 5 over 1 minus 6, which is negative 5 over negative 5, which is 1. I was looking a little grim there for a moment. So that means tangent of beta minus alpha is 1. Now, we can go and say, well, what's beta minus alpha? What is the value of that angle, that difference? And to figure that out, I can take the inverse tangent of both sides of this equation. That means that beta minus alpha, the thing that I'm trying to figure out here, is equal to inverse tangent of 1. What's the inverse tangent of 1? Oh, it's like, what angle is associated with the slope of 1? 45. 45 degrees. And that's the answer. So to do that, I never had to figure out what the angle alpha was or what the angle beta was. I was able to use this technique and only figure out one angle using an inverse tangent function. Pretty cool. Number two. For x is between 0 and 2 pi, find all solutions to this equation. So I want to isolate the cosine. So I'm basically solving for cosine of x first. So I'll rewrite a little bit. 3 cosine of x equals 5 minus 7 or cosine of x equals negative two-thirds. All right, now let me think about what this looks like. If I drew a little unit circle, cosine of x is negative two-thirds. That means I'm looking for, cosine is the x-coordinate on the unit circle. I'm looking for angles that match negative two-thirds. So that would be this angle and this angle. Now, the first step is to take the inverse cosine of both sides of my equation. x equals inverse cosine of negative 2 thirds. And when you do that, that's not something that's on your unit circle as a nice angle. You have to do that on your calculator, making sure that you're in radian mode. And that is 2.30 roughly. That is your first solution. The second solution, so that's this 2.30. The second solution, we're going to have an angle here that's the same, except it's negative from one full rotation. So to find that second solution, we'll do one full revolution in radians, which is 2 pi, minus 2.30. And at this point, we don't really have to worry about being exact because 2.30 is not exact. So we can evaluate this as an approximate decimal, and we get 3.98. So that 3.98 would be the angle you would measure from the x-axis positive all the way around to there. Three point nine eight. Question? No? Okay. Number three, write cosine of x as a horizontal shift of sine of x in two different ways. Yikes. Okay, so we need to be really familiar with what sine of x and cosine of x look like. So I'm going to make a sketch. 
sine of x looks like that. Cosine of x, I'll mark some points here so I get it just right. Starts high, does that. Okay, so we're using sine of x as our parent function. So I would say cosine of x represents a shift to the left of a quarter cycle. Um, and a quarter cycle in radians would be pi over 2. Or I could look at it as a shift to the right of three-quarter cycle, which is 3 pi over 2. So to write that two different ways, I would say the first case, Shift left of pi over 2 would be sine of x. And a shift to the left is with a positive. So we're going to add one quarter cycle in radians, which is pi over 2. To do the other one, the shift right of 3 pi over 2, we have sine of x. Shift to the right is negative 3 pi over 2. This is left, and this is right. Question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Number four, probably something, I don't know if we had this in the homework or not. This is interesting. Um, the thing to recognize about this equation is that it looks sort of like a quadratic. You have something squared minus something minus a constant equals zero. So we could use a substitution and say, for example, u equals sine of y. And by doing that, I would then rewrite this equation as u squared minus u minus 2 equals zero. And then I could factor that. Uh, u minus 2 times u plus 1 equals 0. And now I've got two equations to consider. I've got u equals 2 would solve this equation, and u equals negative 1 would solve this equation. So I can go and substitute back my sine of y for u and rewrite these again and say two equations that I'm looking at are sine of y equals 2 and sine of y equals negative 1. Now, the first one, if you go find out, look on your unit circle to see what angle y has a sine of 2, you'd quickly realize it's not going to work. There is no place on the unit circle that has a y coordinate of 2. It's not possible. There is no angle. There's no real angle that does that. So that is not a solution. Ignore that one. The second one, sine of y equals negative 1, well, there is a place for that. Two hundred seventy degrees. And notice I'm answering in degrees because the interval that I'm supposed to find solutions for is stated in degrees. And unlike some of these other things that we've been working with, this one has only one solution in that interval. Okay, we're almost done.
suppose A and B are two angles such that sine of A is 12 thirteenths, cosine of B is 3 fourths. Angle A is in the second quadrant. Angle B is in the first quadrant. Oh dear. Um, find the exact value of cosine of A minus B. Shoot. Okay. So with quadrant information here, let me do some thinking. Maybe a little Please. diagram would be helpful. A is in the second quadrant and has a sine of 12 13th. So that would be something like that. Sine is positive in the second quadrant, so having a positive sine of 12 13th makes sense. Um, however, if we looked at the cosine of A, it should be a negative value. And we can think of this as a right triangle in the second quadrant. We know the radius or the hypotenuse is 13, and the y value is 12, so the x is going to be negative 5. So that identifies, um, helps us to calculate what the cosine would be, if we ever need to do that. Cosine of b, 3 fourths, b is in the first quadrant, so we've got an angle roughly like this. Um, actually, let me not make that quite as long. The hypotenuse is 4, and the x-coordinate is 3, and the y-coordinate, I think maybe the author of this question was hoping to get a 3, 4, 5 triangle, but it's not the right hypotenuse for that. So for this, uh, we'd have square root of 16 minus 9, which is the square root of 7. Pick. So there's our y coordinate for angle A, or B, sorry. This is B. Okay. So now we can go ahead. So we have to figure that out because we're going to do the angle difference formula for cosine. Cosine of A minus B is cosine A, cosine B, plus sine A, sine B. And we get to fill in all these things. Cosine of A um, is going to be the x over y for angle A, which is negative 5 thirteenths, times cosine of B. Cosine of B is given to us. That's 3 fourths plus sine of A was given to us. That's 12 thirteenths. 13, not B. And sine of B is not given to us, but we can figure it out from our little triangle for B. It's going to be rad 7 over 4. And that actually is uh, an exact correct answer for that. We have a common denominator we can work with. Uh, 4 times 13 is 52. So we have negative 15 plus 12 rad 7 over 52. Um, that's pretty good. And that's it. Yay. Yay. <laughs>